to Unified Conferencing.
Thank you. Uh, you know, my mom actually was upset at first because when I wrote my first uh, Tony Award acceptance speech, I kind of forgot to put her in it. So, yeah. Um, anyway, this is my seminar. Um, today we'll be talking about vegetation forming determinants in staphylococcal endocarditis. And the way that we're going to approach that is using a multidisciplined approach. So we're going to start out by talking about elements like, and now my clicker's not working. Okay, there we go. Elements like genomics and bioinformatics, and then move into elements of biochemistry and molecular techniques. So just as a general outline, we'll start by talking about what the problem is, and then we'll move into the solutions to this problem and where our lab fits into those solutions. Then we'll talk about some, some of the conclusions of some of the results that we've produced so far, and then talk about a lot of the future studies that will still need to be done. So what is the problem that we're talking about? The problem is a, an infection called infective endocarditis. And this is a, a bacterial infection of the heart valves, and it occurs in about four to six cases per 100,000 people annually. So that ends up being about 15,000 to 18,000 cases per year. The mortality rate in these infections is, is very high. It's between 25 and 47 percent, even with antibiotic treatment. And a lot of that is due to these, the, the vegetation formations and the way to treat that and, and what occurs when you treat that, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then lastly, this coagulase positive Staph aureus um, prevalence in these infections is between 30 to 50 percent, which is um, very high. So that's complicated by the fact that this methicillin resistant Staph aureus is on the rise in these infections. It's almost now up to one in every two Staph aureus driven infections, which is very high. Uh, and at the same time, the vacomycin treatment of these infections is becoming um, less effective. So let's just start by talking about the pathology of endocarditis in general. So what first happens is there's this vascular injury that occurs on the endothelium of the heart valve. From there, host thrombotic events uh, form a uh, basically the beginnings of a clot on that endothelium. When this is in the presence of bacteria in the bloodstream, which is termed bacteremia, what you see is this bacteremia um, localizes itself on that vegetation and begins to form a bacterial vegetation. So um, from there, fibrin is deposited onto this vegetation and layering occurs. So you're talking about a bacterial layer and then a fibrin layer and then another bacterial layer. So this creates problems on that heart valve. Let's take an example of a protein from Staph aureus that's kind of the perfect example of two different roles in these infections. So staphylocoagulase, first of all, is involved in this deposition of fibrin, so cleaving, uh, activating these zymogens to cleave fibrinogen into fibrin. So the way that that works is usually in vivo, without the presence of this protein, prothrombin is cleaved by 10A and 5A, factors 10A and 5A, and this isoleucine residue inserts into this isoleucine cleft. And that creates the active site, that creates the thrombin molecule, which is then able to cleave fibrinogen into fibrin. What happens in this infection model is that this protein, staphylocoagulase, is released by Staph aureus, and it has an affinity for the exocyte on prothrombin. So from there, this isoleucine residue, which is present on the bacterial protein, is inserted into this isoleucine cleft and creates the active form. So now this is able to cleave fibrinogen without the need for this regulatory mechanism, this cleaving by, um, by factors 10A and 5A. This, what you see here, is a, a, an image basically of these, this um, folding motif that is involved in binding these exocytes. So these are three helix turns, and these three helix turns are supercoiled, and um, there's two of them. So this is the two three helix motif, and this is present in the coagulase and what allows it basically to activate or to, to bind and adhere to that thrombin molecule. Um, at the same time, a molecule like streptokinase doesn't contain these folds and is therefore not able to enact the same activity. So this is the uh, depiction of the second role of staphylocoagulase in these infections. And this is, these are the recent results from Nature Medicine. And what, we, what uh, Dr. Panisi basically showed is that these uh, staphylocoagulase molecules have an affinity for this fibrin in these vegetations. So this, this prothrombin staphylocoagulase complex localizes to that vegetation based on these repeat regions that are seen in staphylocoagulase. So let's take an example now of another protein um, that basically has a similar fold and how that similar fold can help us predict what this protein does in vivo. 
So basically, this VWBP, which is von Willebrand factor binding protein, contains that similar supercoiled three helix fold that we saw a second ago. So it's also able to bind and activate prothrombin and cleave fibrinogen into fibrin. However, a small change in this molecule has introduced a von Willebrand factor binding site, and that allows this protein to enact its mechanism in areas where there's high von Willebrand factor present. So that becomes more relevant for some of, the, um, some of the infection models that we look at. So that leads us to the overall focus of our lab. The overall focus in our lab is to characterize the pathogenicity of Staph aureus and then to take the proteins and these, these uh, virulence factors in this pathogenicity and understand their differences, how they differ slightly, and how those, those differences enact a different mechanism in these infection models. So what, what are the effects of that difference in the infection model? From there, we want to exploit those mechanisms for diagnostic tools to help us develop ways to visualize these infections. More specifically, the focus of this study is twofold. First of all, a genomic characterization of a prevalent strain, which is TAGR-104, um, in these infection models. And secondly, a biochemical and molecular study of a, a, a protein that's been recently described but little understood. So this protein is EFB, uh, extracellular fibrinogen binding protein, and we'll, we'll get to that a little later. But let's start by talking about this genomic study. So why did we select TAGR-104? TAGR-104 has been published since 1947 by a researcher named TAGR in uh, Emory University. He's a microbiologist at Emory University. And um, since then, since this study, there's been very little characterization of this isolate. However, um, we have seen that it forms these characteristic vegetations, these picture-perfect vegetations in this endocarditol infection model that we use, which is shown here. So this is, the, uh, this is the heart valve, these are histology. This is basically a, a gram stain and an H&E stain. And what you can see is that this bacterial load is, is um, localized here on this, this um, heart valve. And you can also see that this tethering has occurred, um, and that's also relevant for these, these infections. This is the, the fluorescent images that came from that staphylococcus prothrombin study. And what you can see here also is that TAGR is among the highest in fluorescent signal for, these, um, for this localization and for these vegetations. So TAGR-104 forms these very strong and very um, uh, characteristic vegetations in vivo. The technique that we decided to use was a system called the Illumina MySeq sequencer. And it's basically a newer system that uses these, these small fragments produced from genomic DNA. So these fragments are about 200 to 500 base pairs in length. From there, um, you use a kit, basically, to ligate adapters to the ends of these fragments. And that allows them to adhere to the flow cell. And this flow cell um, then allows the, the reads to be made. So the sequence is made first in one direction and then in the opposite direction. So this, uh, between this, a cluster, this cluster is reformed, and then the other side of this molecule is red. So these are paired reads, and these reads are about 150 base pairs in length. So the end product, if you read 150 base pairs in one direction and 150 base pairs in the other direction, should be about 300 base pairs if your fragments are the correct length. The way that this sequencing is determined is, is a mechanism they call TrueSeq, but it's basically sequencing by synthesis. So the way that this works is um, there, are there are reversible DNTPs that bind to the molecule and then are released from the molecule. So this is, these, these have different probes on them, and the machine detects the different signals released by those DNTPs. And from that, it allows it to determine what the sequence is. Because of this reversible DNTP and because of this paired end read, the machine is um, able to make much, much more accurate predictions. So what you're talking about are... A, a great deal, a great number of 150 base pair reads. So you get um, very high coverage with very, very low error rates. What you see here are the results from that sequencing run. So the first thing to notice here is that the end, the, the end result is 317 million base pairs. So after considering the fact that that is in both directions, that ends up being about 50x coverage or 50 times coverage for our 2.8 million base pair genome, which means that each base pair in that genome was called at least 50 times by the device. 
Um, so also the thing to notice here is this average length of 236 base pairs um, per paired read. So that ends up being about 300. You know, that, that number could be a little bit higher, but still with 50x coverage and with this histogram showing the, the length of the paired reads, these are very, very good sequencing results. However, those sentences, those reads, don't mean anything to us unless we know the order that they go in. So the way to do that is using these programs called CLC Workbench and Velvet. And what these programs do is construct those reads into contigs or, or paragraphs of sorts. So we basically constructed these contigs using these programs and then submitted them to a server called RAST. RAST is rapid annotation using subsystem technology. So that basically determines the genes that are present in those contigs and assigns them to a subsystem based on what they might be, such as adherence molecules or global regulators. And so basically what you see here is from 317 million base pairs, we trimmed down to 36 contigs. Um, I think the most of which is about 200,000 base pairs in length. So then the characterization of TAGR 104 was going to be made in three steps. First of all, to determine the lineage using the nucleotide sequence. So to determine the, the ancestry of this isolate. Because this isolate is greater than 60 years old, the odds of it being an ancestor for many of the, the newer clinical isolates and also for a lot of different MRSA strains is, is uh, much higher. So that's the first part. Second, we wanted to look at the new genes and determine what new genes that have previously been uncharacterized in Staph aureus infections and then basically determine their effects in, in these infections. Lastly, we wanted to look at the genes that have been characterized so far, the proteins that have been characterized for these infections and do comparisons with uh, already published genomes. But first of all, let's take a look at this, this lineage experiment. So the, way that, the easiest way to do that using the genomic sequence without having to construct the entire genome is through what's called multi-locus sequence typing. And this was designed by uh, Dr. Mark Enright uh, at the Imperial College in London. I think now he's at the University of Bath. But basically what this does is it takes seven genes that are housekeeping genes that are essential for growth in the bacteria. And these seven sequences are given numbers based on previously determined sequences. And these, uh, these numbers then are used to construct an allelic profile. So each one of these has a number, and then that seven number um, profile is submitted to a server, and that's, that's what gives you your sequence type or ST type. You'll also notice that shikimate kinase is one of these genes, and that's uh, one of the targets in Dr. Calderon's lab. Um, and that's you know, essential for the aromatic ring formation in these, in these organisms. So again, the basic, the, the basic mechanism here is, is comparing these genes to the preset identities, which have been determined through PCR and sequencing reactions for, for um, not entire genomes. And then create a 7 gl allelic profile, and then submit that for the ST type. So what you see here is the sequence, alle the, the allele profile for TAGR 104, and then the sequence type determined from this was ST49. So the, the reference genomes, there's 31 currently published reference genomes for Staph aureus. And these are the 31, as well as their ST types. So for some experiments, we compared against all 31 of these reference genomes. And for others, we picked representatives from each ST group um, in order to make the figures a little more simple. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So I know that the program produces these figures because there's so, there's so many Isolates, these figures are a little bit small on, the, uh, on, on these slides, but, um, but bear with me, uh, we'll just point out what's important in these figures and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So what you see basically is that this tagger um, is here along with ST30 and ST36. So ST30, this TCH60 is a methicillin susceptible strain and this uh, ST36 is a well characterized uh, MRSA strain. From there, any organism that has six out of seven of those uh, alleles similar, if it's the same number for six out of seven of those alleles, they're placed into what are called clonal complexes. So the way that this works is these are submitted to a program called eBurst, which is designed by the same um, MLST server. 
and it basically can take the, uh, the ST alleles and associate them into groups based on those clonal complexes. So what you see here is if you compare using all the ST alleles, so every ST type that's ever been explained, um, what you end up getting is uh, a clonal complex of which ST49 is predicted to be the founding member. However, if you use the reference sequences, only the 31 genomes for which um, previous characterizations have been done, ST49 ends up being a, a, a singleton, so it ends up not grouping with any of the other previously uh, referenced genomes. So the prediction here is that ST49 may be a new clonal complex that has not been previously described. From there, we can do whole genome comparisons. However, without constructing the entire genome yet, uh, it's, it's difficult to do these comparisons without using um, RAST server. And what the RAST server does is blasts each of those genes for which a, an open reading frame was determined against the open reading frames of another organism. And from there, it gives these, these maps, basically, and this is mapped against the reference genome to show that the genes in each region, um, the, the percent similarity. So what you see here, the differing colors basically represents the, differ, the, the differing um, um, percentage identities. And the, these teal are much higher versus these reds and yellows, which are much lower. Um, so there, there are three strains that, that I performed this for. The first is RF122, which is a bovine strain. It's a strain that comes from bovine mastitis. Uh, the second strain is MRSA-252, which is a methicillin-resistant strain. And the third is Newman, which is a methicillin-susceptible strain. Also note that there are these gap regions. So there are these regions in these genomes where there's not any coverage. And for most of these, those are repeat regions. So uh, the Illumina MySeq has trouble covering those repeat regions. So anywhere where, where repeats occur, it has trouble spanning those regions because it has trouble figuring out where to map those and figuring out how to construct those. So um, we'll talk a little bit later about how we want to overcome that. The third way to characterize the lineage is using genomic islands. And these genomic islands are basically pieces of foreign DNA that have ended up within the host genome, either from phages or from mobile genetic elements from other organisms for, through conjugation, or transformation, a lot of those different mechanisms uh, in nature. So this is a, a program called uh, Island Viewer, and the way that this program works is it looks at the percent G and C content. So if the, if the gene or if the uh, island has come from another organism, then the percent G and C content should be different than the host G and C content. So basically what you see is in these areas where this GNC content spikes, it makes a prediction that that might be a genomic island. So basically the program predicted five genomic islands, um, and then I ran this using a separate construction with Velvet and found that there were only four. So from there I decided that four of them, until we get the entire genome constructed, um, the, we're going to go with four putative uh, genomic islands. The most characterized of these genomic islands are new SA alpha and new SA beta. And these are two genomic islands that have been found in every Staph aureus uh, strain thus far. And these genomic islands have actually lost their ability to, become, to be mobile genetic elements. They've lost their ability to jump from one genome to another. Because of that, any changes that occur in these genomic islands are passed down through the lineage. So any change that occurs in the structure here will be handed down from strain to strain as they evolve over time. So basically, these are typed based on the, the arrangement of the sequence or based on the, the order of these genes. And you'll see that the order of the genes is different for the different types that are listed here. Um, among the genes listed in this genomic island in new SA alpha are exotoxins, which are, are secreted toxins. Um, a restriction modification system, which involves um, degrading non-host DNA. Um, and then lipoproteins, or proteins involved in the, the construction of the, the membrane. For new SA beta, you see there are serine proteases existent, as well as more restriction modification system genes, um, antibiotic biosynthesis genes, enterotoxins, and leukocytins. So once I did alignments with these genomic islands and drew trees, uh, we basically found that for alpha and beta, the two closest relatives on these trees 
are uh, MW2 and Newman. So because Newman ends up being a closer ancestor on both of these trees, that's kind of the decision that, that we made on this, is that these are both type 2 um, genomic islands. After finding those two, we wanted to characterize the other two genomic islands that were predicted by Island Viewer. So what you see listed here are the genes in order that were determined in that genomic island. So these genes were predicted by both constructions. So we did two constructions, one using that CLC workbench and the second using Velvet. And those are two different systems that use different algorithms to construct the genome. So these have been predicted by both of those, and therefore um, we're fairly confident that these represent genomic islands. So you'll see listed here um, a couple different genes. So the, the genes in this genomic island are mostly phage-based. Um, there's a single-stranded DNA binding protein, a phage antirepressor protein, a phage DNA invertase. So this is most likely a prophage or, or a gene that has come from phages. Uh, secondly, this looks mostly like a pathogenicity island. It contains an ABC transporter ATP binding protein. It contains a, um, two transcriptional regulators, XRE family and Lice R family. So basically, that's the characterizations that we made on genomic islands. So now let's move on and talk about how you determine new genes in a species. So for this strain, um, there's, there was a certain way that we did that. And this is the experiment that we call the spaghetti experiment. And I'll explain that in a second. But basically, the way that this experiment works is you take those paired-end reads and you align them to a reference sequence. So you, you do what's called remapping. So these, these uh, are aligned to the reference sequence, and you collect what are called the unmapped reads. So the reads that didn't map with this reference genome to a certain threshold. So for this threshold, we used 80%. So any gene that had lower than an 80% homology was unmapped, and we collected the pool of those genes. And then we continued doing that for reference genome 2, reference genome 3, all the way through reference genome 31. And that basically gives us a set of reads that are not aligned with any of these reference sequences. Uh, we call it the spaghetti experiment because um, Dr. Lyles, who explained this experiment to me, um, told me that the easiest way to visualize this is if you're throwing spaghetti against a wall and connecting or collecting the noodles that don't stick to that wall and then throwing it against a second wall and collecting the noodles that don't stick to that wall. So that's basically how this works. And then you take the end result and you blast it to determine what genes are present. So these are the blast results from that experiment. And you'll see there's a couple of interesting um, proteins here. First of all, that VWBP gene, that von Willebrand binding protein gene, was determined to only have 76% identities with the reference genomes. That's the maximum. Um, secondly, this uh, fibronectin binding protein, which is involved in adherence, uh, was found to only have 74% homology. And also, there are several of these hypothetical proteins or membrane proteins at lower than 72%. So those, um, there's still a lot of characterization that needs to be done here, but that's the initial results from that experiment. Lastly, let's look at determining the virulence factors or, or um, basically doing comparisons versus the uh, reference genomes. So first, we did what's called a blast matrix. And the way that this works is that those contigs, those 36 contigs, are assembled into what is called a pseudogenome. And the way that that works is it's basically the contigs concatenated together start to finish. So uh, contig 1 and then contig 2, 3, 4, without any breaks. Um, and that pseudogenome can be submitted to a program that determines what the open reading frames are and then translates them. So this program predicts the open reading frames and translates them into proteins. From there, the program compares those open reading frames to the open reading frames or the, the protein products of all the other reference genomes that you give it. So what we did for this um, is pick a representative from each ST type, because otherwise this figure would be much larger than, than this slide. But basically, we picked a, refer or a reference from each ST type, and you'll see that the results showed that the highest percentage here, it's, it, it's hard to read, but this basically is um, an 84% similarity. So the highest percentage here is to ST8, which is uh, Newman, and then the lowest is to TW20, which is an ST239 strain. And the lowest there is 76.7%. The other thing that you'll notice is that there are these red boxes at the bottom. So what that does is it compares the homology within the proteome. So within that own, the, that own proteome, it compares all the open reading frames and, and determines a number that represents the homology within that proteome. 
So these are just a couple examples of virulence factors involved in endocarditis infections. So first of all, there are these, these um, surface expressed adherence molecules like clumping factor A, which has affinity for fibrinogen, and fibronectin binding protein, which has affinity for fibronectin. Also, there are these fibrinogen binding and deposition proteins like staphylocoagulase, von Willebrand factor binding protein, and extracellular fibrinogen binding protein. Uh, there's also these, these um, regulators such as AGR, which is the quorum sensing regulator, as well as SAE, which has been shown to upregulate the coagulase release. Um, also, there's uh, a couple of virulence factors involved in dissemination, so breaking up these vegetations and releasing bacteria back into the bloodstream, such as staphylokinase, excuse me, which works a lot like um, streptokinase in ways. And then also this extracellular fibrinogen binding protein may have other effects in vivo, um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But ba these are basically the trees drawn off of the alignments of the protein sequences. So this first one here is based on coagulase, and the second one is based on von Willebrand factor binding protein. And these are alignments, and then those alignments are used to draw um, trees based on the divergence of those protein sequences. And what you'll see is that TAGR 104 ends up basically in different places based on what virulence factors you're talking about. So the nearest ancestor here for coagulase is this ED133. And you see that ED133 is actually much more distant in this tree. And the, vice, you know, the opposite is true. For HO5096 here, it ends up much more distant in this tree. So the initial conclusion here is that these virulence factors have diverged differently depending on the identity of that virulence factor. So the overall conclusions for this next generation sequencing is that TAGR-104 is an ST49 strain with both new, um, new SA alpha and new SA beta most closely related to Newman. Uh, secondly, TAGR-104 may represent a new clonal complex which has not been previously characterized in these endocarditis infections. Thirdly, uh, the proteome similarities of TAGR-104 are between 76 and 84 percent of the other strains that have been previously characterized using um, whole genome sequencing. And lastly, that the virulence factor secondary structures have diverged in TAGR-104 differently depending on the identity of that virulence factor. So th there's a couple of shortcomings in this study. First of all, like I said, we need longer reads in order to, to span those repeat regions. So the method that we've chosen to do this with is a, a method called PAC biosequencing. And because of the different mechanism of this sequencer, it's able to do much longer reads. So this, this sequencer can do reads of about 1,500 base pairs to 2,000 base pairs. However, the error rate for the sequencing is much higher. It's about 15 percent. So these, these sequences cannot be used alone to construct the genome. But when it's coupled with our MySeq results, it should be a good amount in order to create the entire genome start to finish. Um, secondly, once we get that sequence, we want to construct whole genome dendrograms. So rather than just using MLST to determine the lineage, we would like to do the entire genome, do a, a base pair by base pair comparison and study the, um, the dendrogram that way. Um, also, we want to continue uh, determining the significance of those genomic islands and the significance of those unmet genes. So what you see depicted here are the kind of characterizations you can do with a whole genome sequence. Um, this comes from a program called CIRCOS, but basically uh, if you split this down the middle, uh, RN4220, which is a, a um, laboratory strain used mostly for, for cloning in Staph aureus, um, and its ancestor or its parent, NCTC8325, you can basically see that there are a couple of characterizations you can make that you can't make unless you have the entire genome sequence resolved. So you can see that there are these elements here where there's no, the, these colored ribbons basically represent similarity of genes. So this here is the same as this gene here. Um, and you can also see that there are these deletion regions. So there are regions, there are genes that are here that are not over on RN4220. So somehow those genes became deleted or removed from the genome. Also, you can see that there are several of these ribbons which um, twist and go the other direction. And what that is, is a a um, basically a reversal, so that gene has been switched or reversed in the genome. And you can only see that if you have the entire genome resolved. So uh, for you chemists, there, there's, a, there's a chirality here, right, between these two, these two genomes. And that's, kind of, that's the kind of distinction that we want to be able to make. So now let's move into our second study, which is this extracellular fibrinogen binding protein.
So why do we have an interest in this protein? This protein so far has been found in 99.1% of clinical isolates, so it's highly conserved. Um, however, there's not been a, a great deal of study into the fibrinogen aspects, the fibrinogen binding aspects of this protein. It's also been shown um, using radioactively labeled bacteria to have a higher adherence to immobilized fibrinogen than clumping factor. Most recently, um, the, the adherence to fibrinogen, the attachment to fibrinogen has, has begun to be described. And basically, this is, these are ELISA-type assays studying the binding of fibrinogen to EFB. And what you can see based on A here is that um, to immobilized fibrinogen, EFB and EFB, the N-terminal the domain, um, have the greatest affinity for that immobilized fibrinogen, whereas the C-terminal domain, which has been previously described to have um, involvement in complement system and dis dysregulation of the complement system, has almost no affinity for fibrinogen. At the same time, immobilized EFB, th this is fibrinogen versus immobilized EFB. There's also, um, they've also shown that soluble fibrinogen, so um, in basically a, an inhibition assay, they showed that soluble fibrinogen has an effect on this, this adherence, and the IC50 was predicted to be about 142 uh, nanomolar. Lastly, this is the EFBN concentration versus fibrinogen and different domains of fibrinogen. So the way that fibrinogen works is it is what's called a dimer of trimers. So basically there's these two, these two D domains and then this E domain. And what they've shown is that the EFB molecule, the N terminal domain of EFB, only has adherence to this D domain on fibrinogen. So again, um, when we talked about staphylocoagulase, we mentioned that the staphylocoagulase localizes to these growing endo uh, endothelium vegetations based on these repeat regions that are present on the molecule. So these repeat regions have the fibrinogen binding activity and localize the prothrom and staphylocoagulase complex to these vegetations. So once we looked at the EFB molecule, we understood that there's a, a greater than 70% homology between these repeat regions and the EFB repeat regions. So we predict, basically, the hypothesis is, is that this EFB will localize to these vegetations. In order to confirm the previous results and to determine um, the affinity of fibrinogen for EFB, we did a steady state study. So we um, basically ran native gels. So these are gels containing no SDS, and um, these are non-reducing gels. So basically, once the EFB fibrinogen complex is formed, after we place the two together and allow them to reach steady state or equilibrium for about 20 minutes. We ran it on a gel, and what you can see is that this mobility shift occurs, and this mobility shift is driven by the formation of that complex. So when EFE and fibrinogen form a complex, they move differently in the gel. They move less in the gel than fibrinogen alone. Because EFB is such a small protein, we weren't able to visualize it on these native gels. So these are the native gels, and these are regular SDS page gels. Um, the difference between the top and the bottom is that this is uh, a fluorescent uh, view using the fluorescent fibrinogen. So we have a, a, um, a fluorescent probe or a fluorescent version of fibrinogen uh, that we use in these experiments. And then you see basically that the EFB content is increasing here. So this is basically to show the reviewers that EFB is present in these gels. Uh, so you can basically see that the EFB fibrinogen, as EFB increases, the amount of free fibrinogen decreases. So fibrinogen is forming complex with EFB and is moving differently in the gel. From there, we wanted to go into some, um, basically, a creation of a fluorescent analog of EFB. And the way to do that is to introduce a cysteine residue, because there wasn't a cysteine residue already present on the EFB molecule. So we performed a site-directed mutagenesis to introduce the cysteine residue in the molecule so that we can bind um, iodoacetamine containing a fluorescein to it. So that creates a fluorescent probe. Um, so this, these are the, this is the chromatogram from that site-directed mutagenesis, and we were able to introduce this cysteine residue. So where do we go from here? First of all, we've got to finish creation of that 5-iodoacetamine fluorescein tagged EFB. And then we can use that tagged EFB for equilibrium binding studies in order to determine the KD for this molecule, for this, this complex.
Um, then we want to move on to in vivo studies and inject this fluorescent probe basically into a thrombosis model and an endocarditol model with the hypothesis that it will localize to those vegetations and to those clots that are forming. And then image these using the Ivis Lumina XR, which is our in vivo imager, and then our Olympus MVX10 using ex vivo imaging. Um, this is fluorescent imaging and also using um, gram stain and H&E stain. So with that, that's, that's, the, um, that's the, the results that we have thus far. This, there's still a lot to do. But um, I'd like to thank my professors, um, my major professor, Dr. Panisi, um, and Dr. Lyles, who has been a constant collaborator, as well as Dr. DeRider and Dr. Shen, the, the members of my committee. I'd also like to thank the, the students that I've had a chance to work with uh, and that I, I look forward to continuing to work with. Um, John Gear at Lyles' lab and Andrew Brannon here at Benizi's lab, and then all my fellow uh, pharmacal science graduate students. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Alabama Supercomputer Authority and the CSC for use of the Alabama Supercomputer, um, Chris Smith in the Panizi lab, and my family and friends who um, I hope will be watching this later and not at right now. <laughs> um, Pictured here is uh, Dr. Peter Panizzi and, and I. Um, we're working on a liquid nitrogen experiment here. Um, but this is kind of in the early days. You can see I still have my hair. Um, so that's pretty much it. So are there any questions? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. The, the easiest way um, is just basically because the, the, these genomes only have one, um, one allele basically for that, is to just delete that and to see what the effects are. And you can do like a, you can do a, a complete deletion or a complete removal of that gene and then um, basically try to grow it on media. And if you have to, um, you try growing it on minimal media or on media that, that would, have, would have early predecessors to that process. And then if it won't grow on that, then you can try growing it on other media um, containing those aromatic compounds or containing compounds that the organism can use instead. Um, and that's, so far as I know, that's the, that's the way that they, they do that. But I haven't actually seen the paper that proved that shikimate kinase is necessary. Um, I've only read his work and how he determined that the, these were the seven genes that he wanted to use for this process. What was the? What, what, uh, what is your opinion on uh, kinase as a target for S albus? Yeah. Um, it's it's possible, um, but I, I'm you know I, I'd be hard pressed to really say one way or the other on that. Um, just uh, I, I don't think that I really yet know enough about um, shigmate kinase's role in Staph aureus. Uh, I know that it's very similar. But um, it, it, it could be a potential target. Um, I'm just really not sure. It really depends on uh, how potent it would be in these cells. Um, I, I'm not sure um, based on the, 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 you know, the gram positive versus um, you know, in mycobacterium, there's, you know, there's mycolic acid instead of these, uh, this large peptidoglycan you know, glycan layer. So I, I'm not really sure exactly how well it would be able to penetrate, but, um, but I'm not really sure. It's an interesting question. I'll look into it. Doctor. Thanks. Um, so this is a really, it's a small molecule. So what we decided to do is on each side um, add a cysteine residue. So a cysteine residue on the early side and then a cysteine residue on the, the end of the molecule. And to see kind of, uh, depending on the fold and depending on where that ends up being, um, how, that, how that turns out. Um, I'm not really sure 
uh, how well that'll affect it, but basically we just want to see how that, that's quenched, but uh, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. you, so you entered the same code and you ran a native shell and then you ran it through a normal SDS right. reducing and uh, reducing heat in, right? Mm -hmm. So you got you have only one band on the native shell, but on the shell you have multiple. Right. So these are the three different um, the three different parts of that fibrinogen. So this is a reducing gel. So this is under reducing conditions. So those three are separating under reducing conditions. Um, but there's only one of those three that is tagged. So there's only one of the three that has that fluorescent pro or that fluorescent molecule on it. And because of that, there's only one really that's fluorescing in this gel. This is non-reducing conditions. So they're all linked together for that reason. Right. Right. Uh, well, basically, because these are um, th these don't run the same distance. Also, because it's a native gel, and they're just going to run um, without the you know without the charge being changed. Um, so these will run differently, and that's why there's a dip. But the difference are, are you do you mean the difference between this lower and this higher? Um, so basically, this is this is free fibrinogen. So this is fibrinogen that's free in the solution, and then this is fibrinogen that's binding to EFB creating a complex, and because of that, it's traveling differently in the gel. Because of the difference in the, um, basically the difference in how that molecule now, the surface of that molecule and, and, and um, the properties of that molecule. Did that? Okay. Dr. Shen. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, you try to make a case, say the tiger won't go for it, that is that brand new species that equalize to it? No, um, it, it's actually, oh, I knocked my mic off. Um, it's actually uh, very old. So it, it was isolated in 19, earlier than 1947. And then Dr. Tagger at Emory University has been, uh, was characterizing it in that 1947 paper for its coagulase activity. So um, Dr. Panisi obtained this strain, um, you know, uh, somewhere between then and now. Uh, he obtained it and has been working with it since in his infection models. Mm -hmm. so, my point is that is that possible if it's different in patients, the etchous gene is not the tiger for the whole body. The variable skin is not just the this particular gene. So how representative is this gene here for this disease? So the strain has been characterized um, from bacteremias and from blood infections. So it's very possible that this is, this is a strain that can occur in these infections. It is a, a bacteremia strain. Uh, and really, um, any bacteremic strain in the bloodstream will be able to form these endocarditis infections you know, with, with a varying amount of, of success, but they, really any that's in the bloodstream can be able to form it as long as these thrombotic events are pot, like present. Um, so I've been looking through the literature trying to figure out where these ST49 strains are generally characterized, and um, I've had some difficulty so far um, tracking that down. But uh, that's, that's one thing that I am still working on and one thing that I will have to continue to look at. It, it is, yes, so there are different ST types and there are different clonal complexes that can create the same diseases. Um, what we kind of want to take a look at, and that involves a lot of literature and a lot of, um, a lot of seeing what has been characterized, is to determine what the differences in tagger are that cause it to form these really strong um, vegetations like we saw here. So even, you know, tagger 104 here, greater than Zen 8.1 and Zen 29, which are different, different strains.
Um, so that's, that, that is one of the things that we really want to look into and continue to look into. And once we have the entire genome, a lot of those will probably be easier to make. So for this imager, for this Ivis Lumina, um, most of the probes that we want to use because of the autofluorescent are, are far red or near far red probes. Um, so with that in mind, we, we're setting out to, to choose probes that are within those wavelengths or within, within those signaling um, capacities. Um, so the one that we pick right now is 5IAF, and uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what the, the wavelengths in that are, but we did select it with that, uh, with that need in mind. Right. We'll never see it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we buy it and basically... The two react together, so it basically forms the you know a cystine, and it's 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 bound, or it's a, a part of that molecule. Chemical compound. Thanks.
the conference is about to end.